All right, hello everyone and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Alicia Lord and I am with OJJDP's NTech. We are the technical host for today's presentation. Before we get into the presentation, I'm just gonna go over some housekeeping items for today's presentation. Uh, please note that there is a poll question in the bottom right of your corner. Please feel free to fill that out um, as we go over some housekeeping items. Just a note that today's presentation is being recorded. It will be published on OJJDP's multimedia page as well as their YouTube channel. Past presentations are also available on both the YouTube and multimedia page. If you have any audio or technical issues today, please let us know in the chat and please make sure you select host before hitting send and we'll attend to those technical issues privately. We do encourage uh, questions during today's presentation. So if you have any questions, uh, please put them in the chat and make sure to select all panelists before hitting send. And finally, please help us count. If you're viewing by yourself, there's no need to do anything at this time. But if you are viewing as a group, please go to the chat window now and type in the number of additional people joining you today. You will also receive a certificate of attendance for this event. These are automatically sent from WebEx uh, to your email that you registered with. Uh, please keep an eye on your spam folder as well if you don't receive it within the next 24 hours. This is an overview of today's presentation and I will turn it over to Basilia, who is today's moderator. Felicia. Hi everyone, my name is Basilia Padilla and I am the program coordinator for the SHIFT program here at the Innocent Justice Foundation. We are funded by OJJDP, which allows us to bring you these webinars free of charge. And again, that's just my information and title. Now, just to give a brief overview of our organization, we were founded back in 2007 to support ICAC teams and their affiliates. And this webinar was sort of created with that audience in mind. We know that the work that you all do is very difficult and can be very challenging. And we hope that throughout this webinar, we can create a safe space where we can discuss the importance of optimism and purpose and how it relates to our overall mental health and well being. So typically our shift program uh, was created to support ICAC teams and their affiliates, as I mentioned. And throughout our experience in working with them, we realized that the exposure to the material that they were reviewing can have long term negative impacts. And we sort of provide these trainings to give them tools to mitigate that stress and that vicarious trauma that they may be experiencing. But before I pass it along to our presenters, uh, I just wanted to note that we did receive all your registration questions uh, beforehand, and unfortunately, I, we did get quite a few, so I don't think we'll have time to go through all of them. We will have some time at the end for questions, and if you have any questions, as Alicia mentioned, feel free to include them in the chat. I will be going off camera and on mute, but uh, Again, if you have any questions or comments, I will definitely relay those to our trainers. But without further ado, take it away. Carolyn Roger. Hello, my name is Carol Bruska and I am a licensed marriage and family therapist. I'm also the Attorney General of New Mexico Attorney General's Office's um, mental health provider for the ICAC and the uh, Human Trafficking Task Force. Um, I also do some other work with victims of domestic violence with uh, sexual assault victims, with people in recovery, and I'm the clinical director for um, an outpatient uh, street rehab for clients who are experiencing homelessness, mental illness, and are also using substances. So I have um, a wide variety of audiences that I'm usually working with, so it's a wonderful opportunity for me to be able to see how the skills that we're going to be talking about today can work in any environment and with any individual. Really excited to be here today. Optimism is one of my favorite topics. I love to try to keep an optimistic attitude because I feel like it's much more beneficial and useful to me than the, the opposite. So glad to be here. Um, please feel free if you have any questions for me or um, Roger or Basilia, just enter anything you have in the chat and um, I'm gonna turn it over to Roger. Okay, thanks very much, Carol. Uh, <clears throat> It's a great honor to be here um, working with Carol. Carol's a mental health professional. I have, I am not, <laughs> I'm just an attorney. Uh, I did this work for quite a long time. This was the bulk of my career. So just a brief background. 
Uh, I was a special victims prosecutor, primarily special victims. I mean, as a rookie prosecutor, I did traffic in criminal court and uh, a few other things, but I always wanted to prosecute crimes against women and children, uh, the elderly, people with disabilities, et cetera, et cetera. And I was blessed to be able to do that. I was in Alexandria, Virginia, outside of Washington, D.C. for almost seven years. Um, I went to the National District Attorneys Association. I was doing training full time in their child abuse unit, went back to the courtroom. I was in the Bronx in New York City for a couple of years. Then I worked for the attorney general's office in their sex offender management unit. I was handling civil commitment or what, what's called civil management in New York. Uh, from there, I went to the U.S. Army. I was an Army civilian. I was embedded in the JAG Corps training uh, JAGs on the same kind of stuff, investigation and prosecution of child sexual abuse, sexual assault, and uh, things of that nature. So I have absolutely been immersed in, uh, you know, in some of these horrors, unfortunately, the the things that we have to consume as as uh, practitioners in law enforcement and related fields. So, um, and I agree with Carol, optimism is something that I've, um, that I've really tried to focus on, uh, particularly lately. So actually this training was kind of serendipitous for me. Uh, you know, gratitude in particular, which I'll mention later. So I'm grateful to be here and I am looking forward to, uh, you know, just to, to presenting and to hearing your questions and to hearing your thoughts on this. My chat box is open. I'll be taking a look at that too. So um, I guess we'll go ahead and get moving again. Thanks, Carol and Basilia and OJJDP. I'm great to be here. Okay, so our agenda. All right, so again, I, I won't read slides to you, but basically the bullets that you see here, we're gonna take a look at the term itself. What does optimism mean? And how does it uh, sort of, ha how does it wrap around and sort of grasp hope? There's an acronym that we'll take a look at later, H-E-R-O, and optimism and hope uh, are sort of, um, kind of almost bookends for that concept. And then we'll talk about the relationship between optimism and your own physical health. And you know that resilience is super important your mental health and your physical health, of course, are are highly intertwined. Again, I'm not a I'm not a health professional. I'm just a lawyer, but even that I know. And then we're going to talk about um, resources, things that can help you build resilience as you do this work and as you consume these things. So, and and this is for two reasons. It primarily it's to assist you, but it's also to assist us because we need you to keep going. We need for you to continue to be successful and effective uh, in order to you know in order to just promote the safety, the healing of individuals who have been affected by this, uh, and just the, the betterment of everybody. You know, you all are you all are doing God's work, if if uh, if I may use that phrase. And I'm grateful to you. And we need to keep you up to speed, up to date, and we need to keep you healthy. So that's what we're going to be uh, talking about today. Okay. So the you know the. Where, where we begin with this, and you know, this is something I've, I've done these trainings now um, quite a few times, and I think it's really, really important to, before we do anything else, I think it's important to remember that we need to break the stigma that is still very, very prevalent in law enforcement around self-care and looking for resources and assistance when our self-care is threatened. Uh, you know, certainly with Police agencies, firefighters, uh, you know, for a while now, there have been resources for those individuals uh, debriefing after critical incidents and things like that, which makes perfect sense. And for the most part, I think those are accepted. But still, even within those first responder type agencies uh, for individuals on the ground, there's still, a, I think, a fair amount of resistance, uh, an unwillingness to come forward and say, hey, I'm doing OK, but I, I need help or I'm not sure if I'm doing OK. Um, I'm not, I don't know where I am, and or if nothing else, I need resources. Uh, I found, at least in, in my personal experience in prosecution, and I'm not speaking negatively about any of the agencies I work for. I work for wonderful people up and down the line, uh, imperfect people, of course, as am I, and as are all of us. But I, I work for great people, had good managers. Um, but I found in the prosecution community that there was almost no, really, almost no attention paid to the well-being of prosecutors on the job. Um, and, you know, to a certain extent, I that was sometimes explained as, well, you're not a first responder, you're a prosecutor. Yeah, you probably see some really grisly pictures. Uh, you may go out to crime scenes, which I certainly did, uh, certainly in the Bronx I did. 
So you may see the occasional, you know, dead child or dead person or whatever, but you know, it, that's different from you're not a gun carrier, you're not having to run into a burning building. Well, yes, there is a difference in the level of trauma that, or secondary trauma that perhaps uh, a litigator feels. Again, if we're just talking about the attorneys, but obviously we're talking about the whole scope. But regardless, prosecutors uh, and all the judges, court officials, uh, defense attorneys, all of us in the in the justice system uh, bear quite a bit of secondary trauma and have to absorb quite a bit of, uh, again, some really horrific material. And a, a perfect example of that is the, the prolifer uh, proliferation of child pornography. When I started in this business in the mid to late 90s, most of the what we were seeing were still still images of children again they were absolutely horrifying they still are and, and some of those are still stuck in my mind but i have noticed as my career has gone on you know and i think as we all know that what we're dealing with now because of technology is really some high definition video and some really 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 terrible things that uh that just i mean again these these cry out for resources it's not that we can't handle it it's not that we can't do it we can do it and we will continue to do it and try to make the world a better and a safer place. But we need to accept the fact, or we should accept the fact that it's okay to ask for, it's okay to ask for help, it's okay to ask for resources. So first things first, let's try to stop the stigma that surrounds just looking for help. What is optimism? When we're talking about that, what we, I wanna make sure that we all have at least um, the same kind of vision of what we're talking about so we're on the same page. It is that sense of hopefulness. It's the sense that things will be good. There will be a good outcome. We're gonna have confidence. It's, it's you wake up in the morning and you feel like today's gonna be a good day. It's not you wake up in the morning and you think what terrible thing's gonna happen. It's that sense that we have this inner belief that regardless of what it looks like on the surface, we know that the outcome will be um, better than we imagine, or we know the outcome will be a positive one. So it's the sense of hopefulness, meaning that we have hope for the future, we have hope in our present moment. Um, we, you know, we can look back on our past and then use that to help us gain the hopefulness. Confidence about the future. Again, this can come from the fact that we have been able to look at our past and see that when situations have come up, we can have confidence that we were able to get through those and that confidence is gonna help us into the future. So knowing that even when, you know, when it doesn't look like things are gonna be so great, we've got that sense of optimism, that sense of confidence about the future. And then we expect good things to happen. So it's not that we think, well, I hope something good happens. It's the expectation. You just kind of have an inner knowing that things are gonna be okay. And again, that comes from noticing what's happened in your life over time, and then comparing what's happened with how you felt about your situation. And when you felt better about the situation, there was a greater likelihood that positive things were gonna happen. And so it's, that's what optimism is. It's that hopefulness, it's the confidence, and it's expecting that good things are going to happen. Okay, so the first question we're going to ask you to ask yourselves are is what you exactly what you see up there. Uh, Carol's given us a, a great sort of base definition of optimism. So what we want to ask, or we want you to ask yourselves is, are you an optimist? Uh, this is nothing that you have to respond to. You know, I've got the chat box open. We would love to hear your thoughts. Uh, feel free to answer there or to send us any thoughts. But really, we just want you to sort of reflect on it before we get into the material. Um, do you feel already as if you were an optimistic person? So certainly optimism does have a direct correlation with well-being. The science behind optimism really shows that um, there's, if you are an optimist, you're less likely to develop high blood pressure than pessimists. You're um, less likely to suffer stress-induced changes with your immunity and less likely to um, even get heart issues or heart disease. And all of this happens because our attitude is a more positive attitude than a negative attitude. And what we know, there's some other research out there on stress um, by Kelly McGonigal, and what she has shown in her research is that more so than um, the stress that we're going under, it's our attitude about the stress. So if we believe that the stress is gonna kill us, then it's a greater likelihood it will. If we believe that stress will make us sick, there's a greater likelihood that it will. So being able to believe that things are going to be okay 
actually encourages our brain to have that same belief and then respond in that way. It's amazing that our brains can be so manipulated, but it's a good thing. And so all it takes is really focusing on having that optimism, having the belief in the future, knowing that when things go bad, we can get through, and recognizing that sometimes when things do go bad, that gives us the opportunity to look at things a new way, to learn a new um, uh, skill, to try something in a different way that we have in the past to help get us through this. And all of that can help build the optimism because we're saying, okay, I have a belief in the future because in the past I've been able to have these positive experiences and I'm going to try it again. And again, the role of optimism with respect to mental health, it's going to be um, a positive relationship. So if we have a more optimistic attitude, we're going to have less stress, we're going to have less likelihood of depression and anxiety. So overall, the more optimistic you can be, optimistic you can be, the better it is. Now, I'm not trying to say that you just it's this Pollyanna approach where just say everything's going to be peachy and it is, but it's something that you have to work at and we can work at it. And the more we work at it and practice, the easier it gets and the more positive effects we're going to see in our lives. Yeah. Yeah. So, all right. <clears throat> so what threatens our optimism? First of all, I want to say that I'm, I really, I, I've enjoyed the responses that came up. Uh, most people express that they're optimists. At least one person said they're not, which is why they're here, which is great. I'm glad they're here. Uh, but, you know, before we get into optimism, we can talk a little bit about what threatens it. Uh, and someone just put up, I'm a realist. It makes perfect sense to me. I, I get that too. You know, in terms of the, the stressors, the things that, that uh, prevent us from being optimistic, it's all the stuff that you see there. And again, I, I, don't, I don't need to harp on too many of these the priorities that our supervisors have, both our elected officials, uh, people who are under pressure from our elected officials, the the changes in the law, and you know one one of the things that's not on here, but I think is important is the changes in perception. You know, perception of law enforcement in recent years, uh, law enforcement has taken a beating on some fronts. Uh, reform is needed, and that beating in some ways is justified. We do have to do better. We do have to do differently some things. But it's difficult. I mean, if if we are if we find ourselves in a, uh, in a situation where we're in the police prosecution side, we may very you know we may very well be you know facing sort of a, a segment of the public that right now sort of distrusts us or just kind of isn't sure about our leadership. All institutions, I think, are under threat. And I think that's something that kind of always happens, but it's certainly something that we're seeing uh, even a little bit more, I'd say, lately. And again, not not entirely for bad reason, but we're, you know, but. Regardless, these are the things that can uh, just make us feel worse and just make it difficult for us to feel positive. So all the things that you see before you, all of the, the decisions, the work, the priorities, the, uh, the never ending caseloads and, you know, and what appears to be just a never ending stream of bad news. These are the kind of things that get in our way. And so having um, the positive, the optimism and well being considering it, what it means to us, it's a positive, being positive about the future. So do I, again, do I wake up in the morning and feel like I can um, uh, tackle the things that I've got to tackle? There's uh, someone on the chat asked if fear could impact optimism. I believe that that's true, yes. I would think that um, if you are, um, if you've got more fear, it makes it harder to to switch on that I can be optimistic and positive about the future. Absolutely. And so the first step is looking at what that fear is about and can you address that fear? And then as part of that fear, can you look back to a time when things maybe were a little bit more optimistic? Are there times in your life where where things were going better and what made those things go better and what made things different now. So trying to look back on things that might not have been so great or that brought fear to your life and then consider, is there a way that I can shift that now? Um, you know, it's just a matter of learning how to perceive things in a different way. The expectation of a positive result, as we talked about before, before, do I wake up in the morning and think that it's going to be a good day or do I think it's going to be a bad day? And what happens is our brain kind of has a self-fulfilling prophecy. So if I wake up in the morning and I've stubbed my toe and I think, wow, I'm going to have a bad day because I started out by having a um, stubbing my toe, then all day long, my brain is going to look for ways to fulfill that um, expectation. And so if all day long, I've, I've told myself it's going to be a bad day, 
every, my brain's going to be focused on how can I validate that that um, experience. So by that same token, if you can have an expectation of a positive result, then you're telling your brain, I need to be looking for positive things, and you will notice more positive things. It's just how your brain works. You tell your brain to look for something, and it will do that. Um, success in the face of challenges, and that's another key. It's, there are certainly times when we have not had success um, in the face of a challenge, but when we can look back on our life and say there was a challenge and I was able to conquer that and I was able to succeed and what were the steps that I took to make that happen, then you can resource those same types of steps to see if they'll work again. So understanding that we all have challenges and then, you know, just also sitting with yourself for a while and saying, I'm feeling really miserable about this, and that's okay. So it's not a matter of just trying to fluff it over. It's not a matter of just trying to push it under the rug. It's saying life is sometimes really hard and acknowledging that and allowing yourself to feel angry or unhappy or sad about the fact that life is hard sometimes. But then at that same token, at that same point, say, I don't want to sit in this forever, though. Because if I'm sitting in this unhappiness and this anger, my life is not going to go the direction I want. So how do I make that shift and change and uh, change my focus to something where I can look to the future in a positive way? And that's the belief that good things can come from negative event, events. So again, if I, um, my, my nephew and I were driving to camp today, I was dropping him off and it seemed like we hit every single red light. And and he noticed it too, and I and I said, "Yeah, it seems like we're hitting every single red light today." And we said, decided that maybe the universe didn't want us to hurry up and get to camp today. Maybe we just needed to to take our time. And you know, I've there's been times when I've been driving on the road and um, I get blocked from from going where I want to go. And it and I found out later that that was a good thing because there was an accident in front of me or something else, you know, happened. Um, not that I believe that that. There's some sort of mystical thing going on, but you know, sometimes I just have to accept that things don't go the way I want, and there might be a good reason for that. So believing that good things can come from negative events is really important for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the only thing I would add to that is I, you know, I, I think that that feedback loop and that bias, you know, that bias is something that in law enforcement we have to remind ourselves to be to be aware of. You know, the bias in our thinking. Uh, and just sort of going down a rabbit hole, we begin to think one thing and it just sort of feeds on itself. We may be developing the wrong suspect. We may be pursuing a, a legal theory that isn't sound. Uh, so we, you know, we actively work as law enforcement professionals, we actively work to try and eliminate that bias for the sake of fairness, for the sake of justice, for the sake of ethics, for the sake of doing the right thing. And that same kind of attacking bias uh, or preventing bias, I think, can can assist us exactly as Carol states. You wake up, one small thing happens, or maybe a big thing happens, and you begin to think, okay, that's the way this day is going. You're going to look to confirm that bias at every single turn. And, and there was a comment um, about um, that it's more than just thinking and about our nervous system regulation. Absolutely. If we are constantly in fight, flight, freeze, it's really difficult to be optimistic. So learning the skills, and if you want to learn about the skills to um, get out of fight, flight, freeze, I would suggest that you go back to either to our shift website or to some of the past trainings that we've done here because we go into great detail about that. I don't want to take that time right now because I could go on with that for hours and hours. But yes, making sure that you are not in fight, flight, freeze, making sure that your parasympathetic nervous system is in charge, not your sympathetic nervous system. When you are in that mode of feeling safe, that allows you the, the ability to be optimistic. If you are fearing for your life or you're in fight, flight, freeze, it's very difficult to have an optimistic attitude because your brain is just saying, we need to get out of this alive. We need to survive. And in that very basic survival mode, it's harder to be optimistic. So some signs of optimism. Um, some of those might be obstacles, obstacles as opportunities. So if something like I was talking about, you know, we were going to camp and the traffic was bad and we got the red lights. So we saw it as an opportunity to spend some more time talking in the car. You know, it was, it was, there's no point for me personally to go down that negative path in, in most circumstances because what I think about is this serving me or is this hindering me? 
is this helping me or is it hurting me? I always try to do the thing that's going to be helping me. And if um, there's an obstacle that arises and I just perseverate on the negative side of it, it doesn't seem to help me. Um, if it did help me, I would absolutely go there. And sometimes, you know, I just want to sit in that for a little bit, like I was talking about, just sit in that because I just want to allow myself those feelings. But then I decide, okay, I've been there long enough. I need to shift my focus because this is not getting me anywhere. It's seizing the day. So if you have the attitude that, that you're going to get up in the morning and you're going to seize the day and you're going to take advantage of what you can, then that's going to help you be more optimistic. Um, I have some friends that I went to dinner with the other day and they were saying, you know, you seem so busy. Why, why do you, what do you do for downtime? How come you're um, doing all these things? And I said, for me, it is a matter of seizing the day. You know, life is so short. And and there's so many things I want to learn, and there's so many things I want to know about. And so I want to seize the day because I don't want to miss out on any opportunities that I can because life is so short. And then trying to have a positive attitude. I don't know anybody that has a positive attitude every day, all day long. But if that can be the main attitude that you have, if that can be how you try to be every day, when you wake up in the morning, you say, I'm going to meet my challenges and, and look at obstacles as opportunities. I'm going to try to be positive. That will really go a long way. Now, accepting responsibility is a sign of optimism, and that might be one that seems a little bit um, confusing that why does that why what's the correlation there? Well, when we accept responsibility for the things around us that are our responsibility, not that we're taking on responsibility for other people's things, but accepting that responsibility takes the burden off of feeling the guilt and feeling the um, shame and the other things that we might be feeling. It's just saying, yep, I'm the one that forgot to make that phone call, or I'm the one that. Um, that forgot to bring the cookies to camp, whatever it might be. But accepting that responsibility then frees you up to move forward. If we, if there's things that we know happen that we haven't taken responsibility for, it can pick away at us bit by bit, and that's going to be making it difficult for us to be optimistic. And then not dwelling on the negative. Obviously, that that makes sense. You know, if you're focusing on the negative, your brain's looking for the negative. You're going to notice the negative, and that's going to be. Um, your whole mood. So trying to focus on the positive and not the negative is definitely a side of optimism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the only thing I'd add is that I, I think that's terrific, Carol. The only thing I would add is is um, is that it, it is important to forgive yourself and, as Carol said, to allow a few minutes of sort of sitting in that. You know, it's it's okay. You don't you don't need to banish every negative feeling. You don't need to self-flagellate because you had a negative thought. That's entirely okay. You know, sometimes a pity party is just what you need for a few minutes. Uh, it's just important to recognize it for what it is, let it serve its purpose, and then try to move out of it. All right. So the next question we want to ask is, what are you optimistic about? So again, we you don't need to post responses, but we'd love to see them. What are what are the things that you are optimistic about? What are the things that you already have a, a positive outlook about? Uh, it's a challenging world. It's a crazy, crazy time. And, you know, it, it's kind of always been, but uh, certainly this is, you know, this is uh, the, the times that we're living in right now, the things that we're facing are absolutely no less interesting than, than or so it would seem, than anything that's gone before us. So, but regardless, we want to know what are the things that you feel optimistic about at the moment? And one of the reasons that we ask this question is because we're planting the seed. If we can plant the seed for you to start looking for things in your life that you can be optimistic about, then those seeds can grow, and then that can help be the first steps in changing um, to a more optimistic attitude if you don't feel like you're where you're at, where you want to be right now. So the habit of optimistic people, um, expressing gratitude in big and little things. So for me, when Starbucks gets my order right, I'm thankful. When um, I go to a restaurant, put guacamole or avocado on my food, I'm thankful. When I can get to um, wherever I'm going and it's a smooth ride, I'm thankful. And the reason I do that, again, is because I want my brain always focusing, always focusing on the next positive thing, always focusing. Um, because for me, again, that works. And But, of course, being grateful for the big things, the big things like I'm living in a country where I 
have a lot of freedoms that I wouldn't in another country, that I am allowed to sit here today and present to you, and we could talk about what we need to and what we want to without worrying about being um, monitored or we're getting there's some kind of retaliation if we don't say exactly what we have to say. I was um, in a couple of years ago, I was in Tibet, and um, there was a, our guide, our guide was, was with us, and he said every year they have to take a test. And I asked him, was it a test about, you know, the locations that you're going and, and where, what you're seeing? And he said, no, it's making sure that we are talking about what the party line is and tell, and talking and expressing the Chinese government's wishes when we're, when we're um, talking about Tibet. And it made me feel so grateful and such big gratitude for being able to live here in the United States, even though it's not perfect by a long shot, even though we've got lots and lots and lots of issues. I don't fear myself that the government's watching my every move and then going to correct me or throw me in jail. Um, volunteering is good because when we volunteer, it actually increases our oxytocin, and the oxytocin is the feel-good hormone. It makes us want to connect with others, and it just makes us feel lighter and happier in our heart. So if we volunteer our time and our energy, it doesn't mean that you have to have a regular commitment of volunteering in order to get the results of this. You can just do once a year, you can do some sort of two or three hour volunteer situation, and that can be um, help you to become more optimistic. It's nice to join with others who are doing positive things as well as a way to um, as a way to connect, which also increases the oxytocin, and then just to gather together and help somebody else out. So it's helping them out, it's helping you out, and then you watching the happiness in the other person also can increase the oxytocin. Showing genuine interest and concern for others. So think about a time in your life when somebody actually seemed like they really truly cared about what you were saying. Instead of just saying, how are you, and then not even bothering to listen, think about a time when somebody said, how are you, and then they looked you straight in the eye, and they paid attention, and they waited for the answer, and then they gave a response that let you know they were completely interested in what you were saying, and they were concerned for your well-being. Having that sense of um, that sense of uh, optimism from that you have that you can have can give you the possibility and the opportunity to be that for somebody else. And then being on the receiving end of that, it can feel so good to know that someone is genuinely concerned for you and cares about you. Surrounding yourself um, with positive people. So optimistic people have a likelihood of surrounding themselves with positive people because when you feel positive about your environment, about your world, about the things that you're doing, it's hard to be around people that aren't like that. It feels like they're sucking the life out of you. You just want to say, but what about this side? You know, if you, you want to bring in that optimistic side of you and try to point out things that will be beneficial to them and they don't want to hear it because they, for whatever reason, want to be in that um, pessimistic mode and it's either harder for them or they can't see it or life has not given them the opportunity to be optimistic. So I think that being able to um, be around positive people encourages positive conversations, it encourages more positive behaviors, it just makes us feel better. And then being self-motivated. So oftentimes if people are not very um, positive, it's harder to get motivated to do anything because if the attitude is it's not going to be a success anyway, it's harder for me to get motivated. If my attitude is I know it's going to fail or I won't be able to complete this, why should I even bother to try? Much harder to get to get started. But if I have the sense of optimism that I can do it, and it might be a struggle, but I feel confident I can push forward, makes me more self-motivated to do whatever it is that I would like to do so that I can um, move forward. So when we think about some other habits of optimistic people, making sure that we, um, are, uh, when we are optimistic, it's a greater likelihood that there's positive health impacts. And these can be um, all sorts of things like we talked about, lower blood pressure, better um, chance of overall health, decrease in, in um, stress-related uh, medical issues, so less likelihood of heart attacks, less likelihood of depression, 
um, more awareness of health status. So if we're feeling optimistic, we want to do what we can to keep our health um, in optimal, uh, keep us in optimal health, which is then going to help us to be more aware of what's going on. And we're more likely to keep those annual uh, doctor's visits. We're more likely to notice when something isn't right and then take care of it. Someone who is less optimistic might just feel like, well, this is how it's gonna be and there's no sense in me getting out there. So, you know, it's, it's, um, it's, it's going to be beneficial to you if you can have that optimistic attitude. And then it gives you positive coping um, with health stressors. So. What that means is when you do come across something that's negative or you don't get the best health report, your optimistic attitude, believing that things can be better, is going to help you through those health stressors, which we know that mental, your mental attitude is going to um, increase the likelihood of success. Now, obviously, there's some medical issues that we can't just cure by wishful thinking your optimistic attitude, but it can help you through that process. And then there's going to be an increase in happiness. We're just going to feel better. It's going to, when we have a positive attitude, we just want to um, be engaged in things that bring us happiness and around people that are um, making us happy. And overall, we just feel better. And it has positive impacts on our relationships and on our self esteem. So people like to be around positive people. People like to be around people that lift them up, that generally pay attention, that um, can give them some um, boost, uh, pep talks if they need, some boosting up if you need that. And, it, and so there's more likelihood that people are gonna wanna be around you if you're optimistic, and it's gonna increase your self-esteem as well. So basically what we're looking for is a reframe. And you know there, there are many, many aspects of optimism that we're talking about today, but I think probably the, the most basic is this one. This is a definition of the positive mental attitude rather than, you know, sort of sinking and, and you know, sort of sliding down and acknowledging or believing that something can be, or excuse me, cannot be done. The far, far, far more healthy approach is how can this be done? What, what is it that we're facing? Again, that, that doesn't mean we can't have a bad moment. There was a, a really good. Uh, a really good comment that went up a few minutes ago talking about the thin line between optimism and toxic positivity. Ha feeling as if you have to feel positive at every moment is also not fair and it's not realistic. But in general, asking how something can be done rather than saying it can't be done is kind of the crux of everything we're talking about today. So through the lens of optimism, what are the outcomes um, outcomes are a result of effort. And so this, that's what one of the things that I said in the begin very beginning. It's not that um, we're gonna feel optimistic and we can just go out there and, and it's a very simple process. It's, it's a matter of retraining our brain. So it's, you know, if you know about neuroplasticity, um, what that talks about is we have the ability to change our brain throughout our lifetime and we can shift from what we feel um, and, and what we think and change it in a more positive way. So if our, um, if our belief is that we can't do it, but then we start working on changing that, and whenever we notice we're going down that path of this isn't gonna succeed or I'm not gonna do well, if we can change that and when we start to go down that path, we say stop, and then we think about, look at all the times that things, positive things have happened, that can be the beginning of using the neuroplasticity to, re to create a new pathway, which can help us increase our optimism. So, you know, just thinking about um, practicing and practicing and practicing until it becomes a habit. There's, I, I've talked about this on almost every single webinar that I do. There's an activity out of positive psychology called three good things activity, and it helps us to change our, our lens from um, pessimistic to optimistic. So it's just a matter of focusing, making us think about positive things, and then we become, those become a habit, and then it's more natural, and then it's just the way we think. And, you know, thinking that negative events are anomalies. And like we've said, trying to normalize the fact that we do feel bad sometimes. Nobody's saying that this is all about every day is going to be peachy and there's not going to be any bad things. The way life happens, there are good things and there are bad things. And hopefully, if we can be more optimistic, we can draw more positive things into our life. Positive events are evidence of more, posit of more positivity, positivity ahead. So if we have that belief, 
that the more positive we put out, the more positive is going to come back to us, then we can expect that when we are doing things that are um, positive, we're going to get the results of that. And when we are being more optimistic, then we're going to get the results of that. So it's treat, teaching ourselves how to shift our attitude if we don't have a positive attitude now or if we don't have an optimistic attitude, recognizing, again, that not every day is going to be wonderful, acknowledging that some days are miserable and that's okay, trying not to spend too much time sitting in that, and then looking forward to new opportunities, looking at things as a challenge but that, that can give us the opportunity to learn and grow, and taking those positive events that more positivity is going to be coming towards us. Mm -hmm. So the social benefits of all of this, you know, I, I'm sure a lot of this is sort of self-evident, but it's actually very specific as well. It's not just what we would obviously sort of point to. Uh, at work, optimism has been linked to intrinsic motivation to work harder to endure during stressful circumstances and to show more goal-focused behavior. I'm quoting from a study that was done uh, <clears throat> several years ago. But it's important to point out, goal-focused behavior in particular, I think, uh, Henry Ford, who was not the most pleasant person in the world, but he was obviously a pretty bright guy. One of the things that he's sort of famous for saying is that almost any task can be made simple if it's just broken down enough. And the point of that is when we have goals, when we when we feel focused and we feel as if we can get our arms around something, we're going to be better off. Um, you know, the the goal of making the world safer is obviously you know extremely broad and and it seems unattainable most of the time. Okay, but you know the goal of getting through this day, the goal of responding competently and compassionately to this victim or this survivor or this person, or going through this case uh, in you know in the most you know, just in the most um, effective, uh, ethical, and you know, just astute way, these things breaking down our tasks, breaking down our challenges, and becoming goal focused really helps. And optimism is absolutely linked to goal focused behavior. So that feeling of, I believe we can do this, translates into, I believe we can do not just this in the larger sense, but X, something in particular, which really, really helps. And then the community benefits on down, it's contagious. You know, as Carol has said, optimistic people generally like to be around optimistic people. And the more there is, the more that sort of proliferates and it goes through the entire system. Um, we can we can feel it if if we're on the legal side, uh, we're attorneys, we can, you know, we can uh, pass it down and it can be passed to us from the law enforcement side. Um, just sort of working as a team makes everybody more successful. And, you know, when we like to believe this, I'm, I'm not big on a, a vibe person, but I, but I absolutely do believe this, that this, this positivity begins to, you know, to vibrate, so to speak, um, and just kind of permeate everything that we're doing. So how does purpose fit into all of this? Um, purpose is, you know, you, what your life purpose is. That's the central motivating belief. So what is our purpose in life? What are we here for? What do we want to achieve? What's that going to look like? How will we know if we're getting there? Um, when we understand what our purpose is, um, then it allows us the opportunity to kind of figure out where we're going and what it looks like. So to me, purpose is part of the roadmap of our life and it can change over time. When I was in my 20s, my purpose was probably very different than it is now. When, you know, we, when we were in different stages of our life, our purpose changes. When we're younger, we might have um, a purpose that relates to being a part of the community and um, doing positive things. And then we might add in, as we get older, um, being a role model for our children. And then later on, it might be something like supporting our children and helping our parents through their changes. So it's the motivating beliefs that we have about our life it's the aim or the guiding principle. So for me, maybe my purpose is to try to remain positive 95% um, of the time, or it might be my um, guiding principle of life and my purpose is to help support others in their own well-being and happiness. It might be that my purpose is leaving the world a better place and what does that look like? What do I consider a better place and what does that look like in order for me to take those steps to do that? So if leaving the world a better place means that I want to cha train 10,000 people throughout my lifetime about happiness, then that would be my benchmark. But knowing what 
you consider your purpose and then how to measure that and then how to reflect back, that's going to help you because when you understand your purpose and then you add in the optimism about that, that can um, help you to stay on track. Personally unique, but can have a shared aspect with others. So if I um, am with like-minded people, we might all have purpose that is similar, not the exact same. If, you know, most of the people that I'm training with when I'm doing these trainings, we all have a purpose related to giving skills and techniques and tools to others who can benefit from them in a way that allows them to continue to do their work. So even though within that, it might be a little bit different for all of us, there's some sort of shared purpose that we have, and that's why we're all together. And you might notice, that the people that you spend time with, even if you haven't had a conversation about what their purpose is, you might realize that there's a lot of shared values and shared thoughts and purpose around those people as well. So that it's like, that's what brought you together, that's what keeps you together, and that what, that's what helps you in a united front to move forward. Yep, absolutely. And again, I would I would just add that, you know, that that sense of purpose and that's actually that brings us to the next slide we're going to we're going to uh, ask you to ask yourself now do you feel a strong sense of purpose and and what we mean by that is a driving force or a motivation so are you deeply committed or intellectually connected excuse me to someone or something do you have a vision for a better world and a desire to bring it out and you know and this doesn't this can be pretty specific or it can be pretty broad your your sense of purpose uh, it doesn't have to be, uh, there's no right or wrong answer. It doesn't have to be a particular thing, but that's what we're asking you to ask yourself now. And again, we will, we'll, we'll certainly take a look at your responses. You don't have to put them up there, but, um, but we, uh, we welcome them as always. All right. So the next thing we're going to talk about is characteristics. So, you know, what are, what are the things, what, why is it that you get up in the morning? Um, it's, and it's interesting. I'm, I'm, uh, out in, uh, I'm out in Arizona for the week, um, working from out here. And I was talking to a dear friend of mine last night and we were discussing this cause he's, you know, he's looking at retirement and he's kind of like, well, you know, there's gotta be something else out there. And, you know, what, what do I think about next? What do I do next? And we spent a few minutes just talking about it. You know, it's like, well, my wife, I was like, exactly. She's the reason that you get up in the morning, you know, and, and, and it can be as simple as that. You know, you don't, not everybody needs to be, well, my, you know, my, the thing that gets me up is making sure that the world is, uh, is problem free by the time I, you know, by the time I leave the earth. No, that's not going to happen really for any of us. Um, so your sense of purpose doesn't have to be entirely altruistic. It can be, uh, the reason that gets you up in the morning can be something that motivates you because it's something that you love or something that you hold dear, but it is important. Um, purpose guides life decisions, it influences behavior, it shapes goals, it offers a sense of direction, it creates meaning. Uh, and for some people, it's really connected to their vocation. I mean, what makes their work purposeful? What makes their work satisfying? And we're, you know, we're getting uh, some great responses on this too. The, the fact that there isn't necessarily one purpose, it's a process. I agree with that 100%. So thank you for that comment. Um, all of these things, uh, our faith, um, I'm seeing that pop up from time to time. Absolutely. If, if we have a, a strong commitment to faith, if we have a, a relationship with faith, I think that's a wonderful thing that keeps us going and that sort of um, brings us focus. Again, you know, we're talking about focus on goals as well as purpose. What are, you know, what are the goals that you have? How do you get there? But we begin, I guess, with, with that sort of definition of, you know, that definition of a sense of purpose, the thing that motivates you, the thing that really, really gets you moving and keeps you moving. So the psychology of purpose, this is from, like it says there on the John Templeton Foundation. Purpose is a stable and generalized intention to accomplish something that is at once personally meaningful and at the same time leads to productive engagement with some aspect of the world beyond the self. So it's not, purpose is something that's actually um, it's a concrete concept, so it's and it's going to differ across. Um, it, for me, it differs across my lifespan, and it differs across people. But it's something that the intention to accomplish something that is meaningful and leads to production, productive engagement. And so, at some points, like I said, that might have been what I found meaningful when I was 20. Might be very different from what I find meaningful 
in other stages of my life. And then what I consider productive engagement might also change. So maybe when I um, in the midst of working full time and going to school and doing all those things, my productive engagement is not um, is not very uh, time consuming. But then when I've retired and I have more time on my hands, my productive engagement might look very different. I might be able to engage in a way they couldn't when I didn't have as much time. So these things change over time and that's okay. And they change with it um, depending on the individual and that's okay as well. So there's science behind purpose. It's not just something that's random that we talk about. Um, there's uh, a psychological well-being test or um, survey that talks about this, and it says, you know, the questions that they ask around purpose: um, Do you set goals for yourself? How do you view your life? Is there meaning in your life? Do you feel like you're able to reach these goals? So that's the understanding of um, how we can. Uh, make purpose into something that's not just a concept, but it's some clear questions that we can frame to ourselves that we can answer. So people who score their sense of purpose highly in this questionnaire appear to have better cognitive function, longevity, sleep, cardiovascular fitness, and mood. There's um, another study that talks about people that were elderly, and I don't know exactly what elderly includes, but people that are elderly, um, having a positive sense of purpose can reduce their cognitive decline um, by 50%, and uh, it can um, um, increase their sense of connection with others. It can have a better uh, uh, outcome for depression and anxiety. Um, and it also says that um, if you have an optimistic life attitude or a you know your purpose in life, there's a 22% reduced risk of clinical strokes. So we can see the value in doing this absolutely from a physical and a mental health perspective. If we can help shift our our um, our mood and shift our thoughts and shift the way we view things to a more positive, purposeful, optimistic way then it really does play an important role in both our physical and our mental well-being. So some of uh, the benefits that we might see from having a purpose, we might be able to have more focus. If I feel like I have a purpose in my life, then I don't seem to feel so aimless and wandering around aimlessly in the world. It feels like I've got a goal and I like, personally for me, I like to have a goal. Certainly I like to have some free time where I just do nothing but daydream and I do that on a daily basis, but having that sense of purpose, I know where I'm going and how I'm gonna get there. It's again, it's like my roadmap. And so it allows me the, um, the opportunity to think about what are the small steps I need to take and where is my final destination? And what does that look like? And what are the skills I need to learn along the way? Uh, the benefits, another benefit is actually passion. So if I'm feeling like I have a purpose, then it really invigorates me and it gets me excited. And because I know, again, where I'm going and what, I, what my goal is gonna be. So I'm excited about it, I'm passionate about it. And as I express that passion, people um, see the passion in me and then are more likely to encourage me. And this just feeds each other, it feeds and feeds and feeds until it's something that seems very doable for me. It gives me a sense of fulfillment, so it makes me feel like I really can do this and it's going to make me feel more complete. Um, I have the sense that that I'm going in the right direction and my life doesn't feel as empty as it might have in the past because I have a, you know, because I do have a purpose. Um, living a values-based life is another benefit, so it helps me um, to know what my values are. If I'm going to have a purpose, and for me, I need to understand what that means. And so, for me, if my um, I need to start with looking at my values and what are my values. My values are trying to be a positive force in the world. Another value is trying to support people who are in need. Another value that I try to achieve is to be honest and compassionate. So if I know what my values are, then I know um, how to achieve the goals and when I'm on track and when I'm not. So if I notice for, for myself that I have not been acting or being very compassionate, then I can say, okay, I'm, you know, I'm getting off track here. What do I need to do to get back on? Another benefit is actually having fun. So if we have a more positive attitude, we're more likely to open ourselves up to have some fun, to allow ourselves some playtime. 
and there's the um the ability that we have for integrity. If we have a purpose and we're committed to that purpose, we're gonna have some integrity around that and wanna do the right thing. And then it increases our trust and our faith. So it allows us to say, you know, I have faith and trust that these things are gonna come through and having this purpose allows me to trust others in the past. And then grace, grace is so important in every aspect of our life, allowing ourselves to mess up, allowing ourselves to say, I don't feel like being compassionate today. Today, I just want to be selfish and I want to eat ice cream and I want to watch brainless, mindless TV. And that's what I'm going to do. And that's okay. So it's, it's that balance between trying to be the best that we can also recognizing that some days we just don't have it and that's okay. So this is a great acronym, uh, H E R O, and you know what I what I love about it is I think the H and the O really kind of bookend uh, the the E and the R, which are the sort of uh, the two that that's kind of where the struggle is. So it, hopefully we begin hopefully we begin with hope, a sense of energy to just persevere. We believe that in general things are going to get better. Uh, we are going to have struggles. We are going to have failures. Each and every one of us, unless something changes pretty quickly, is going to leave this earth at some point. So, you know, we know that that's ahead of us. Death is a part of life. But in general, we have hope not only for our own lives, but for the lives of the people we love and for the lives of the people that we know we're leaving the world to. And then on the other end is optimism, which is, as you see, being and remaining positive about the likelihood of personal success and our personal success blends with our professional success and it helps to sort of spur on everybody's and then in between that we see what we see where the the kind of up and down is the e for efficacy a belief in your ability to to produce positive results so believing that you can do it and then resiliency which is what comes along when the world slaps you down and says you can't when you get a bad outcome in a case uh when you you know when a, a witness goes south or you know god forbid when a victim dies uh when when something just crumbles in a case uh when a child appears lost when you know when you can't track down a kid who you know is obviously in, involved in something uh some sort of child sexual abuse or exploitation and that child can't be found or located or seems to disappear or something of that nature you know we see these things all the time in this work so having resilience coupled with that sense of efficacy is what leads us finally out back toward optimism. Resilience is really, really important. Optimistic people are just more likely to continue working toward their goals, even when they're faced with obstacles, challenges, and setbacks, and every single one of us, every single one of us are. And then, no, oh, I'm sorry, Carol, did you have something on that? Nope. Oh, okay. All right, so then on to individual benefits, our next slide. Uh, this is very interesting to me when talking about these, the things that you're seeing there, increase in overall health, meaning and focus, um, resiliency building and becoming physically stronger as we age. You know, the, the, the background for this is uh, Viktor Frankl, a, a Viennese psychologist. He was a Holocaust survivor. He, uh, unfortunately, he spent time at three, uh, you know, just, well, actually four unbelievably horrible places, concentration camps. And he noticed that prisoners there who had a sense of purpose actually had greater resilience to the things that they were enduring torture slave labor starvation rations uh it's almost it's certainly impossible for me to understand anything that you know that that frankel and those millions of other people went through um, but i can understand i can appreciate what it is that he's saying that a sense of purpose could pull people through and then, you know, another important quote on this is from uh, a philosopher who I really, really love and is generally not considered a very optimistic guy, but a brilliant, brilliant man, Frederick Nietzsche, who, you know, and this is a really beautiful quote, which I think underpins everything we're talking about today. Those who have a why live and they can bear almost any how. It's not as simple of, as that, but I think that is very, very profound. Those who have a why those who have a reason will continue to live and those 
and they excuse me and they can bear almost any how they can bear almost any process the name of the of the psychologist uh, is victor frankel v-i-k-t-o-r and then the last name frankel f-r-a-n-k-l and of course frederick nietzsche uh his last name is n-i-e-t-z-s-c-h-e nietzsche is uh, just a renowned and, and brilliant psychologist um, and again, for Nietzsche to say something like that is kind of interesting because Nietzsche was considered kind of a, you know, had sort of a dark outlook and was not a very optimistic person. But Nietzsche understood, I think, that those who have a why will continue to persevere and they can get through almost any how. They can endure almost any process if they have an end goal and they feel as if that goal is, uh, is uh, attainable. So moving on, then the next question we're going to ask is what is your why? You know, what is the why? What is, and it, it, it can be as simple as, you know, I have a dog I really love who jumps on my bed every morning, gets me up, and she's the reason that I keep going. That's completely fine and appropriate. It can be several things. It can be your kids. It can be your life. It can be your job. It can be the betterment of your community, whatever. It can be as broad or as narrow as you feel, uh, but it's important that we all have one. So that's the next question that we're asking you. Can we learn to be optimistic? I believe that we can. I have seen it in others when I've worked with clients um, in the past that came in with not a very optimistic attitude and we've worked through that and they've been able to make that shift. Again, it's not like something that happens overnight. It's a process, it takes effort. But if we can recognize the benefits of being optimistic, it can be the motivator that helps us continue to try. And really it's about retraining our brain. Again, it's about learning that um, we can look at things from a different perspective, that there's more than one perspective. And if we can look at a perspective that seems to um, be make us feel better, then there's no harm in doing that, right? So learned optimism is a um, concept from positive psychology. Like I was talking about previously, there's the three good things act activity and that as well from uh, positive psychology. It says that we can learn to have a positive perspective, but the way we go about doing that is we retrain our brain, brain by looking for positive. And I encourage people to look for that positive by writing down things. At the end of the day, you have to write down some positive things that happened to you, positive things that you thought about, positive experiences you had, positive ways you helped others, whatever um, seems most meaningful to you. And then making yourself, committing in the morning, today I'm gonna notice the positive feelings I have throughout the day. Or today I'm gonna to notice the positive things that other people do for me. However you want to um, talk about that, write it down, and then your brain is prepared for that, and so your brain is going to be directed to look for those things all day long. More joy equals better mental health, and we've talked about this previously. The, the more joy you have, the more positive your outlook, the more optimistic you are, it does lead to better mental health because if you're telling your brain all day long that life is miserable and I'm just going to die alone and in a dark room by myself, then that's not going to be encouraging you to do those natural things that you would if you were feeling better about your life, and it's not going to um, help reduce your stress or increase the way you feel. So having more joy and increasing your joy automatically can help lead to better mental health. So one of the things that uh, one of the things I think we need to work on, and I've, I've had a lot of success with this recently, and I'm very, very grateful for it, uh, becoming more mindful practicing gratitude. This is, I think this is just really, really important. Uh, it's particularly when we're in a challenging field like this, particularly when we were in law enforcement, when we are working with troubled youth, when we are working with kids who are, who are abused, exploited, neglected, tortured, uh, when we are on the path that we're on and doing the work that we've chosen to do and that the world needs us to do, um, it's very, very easy to get bogged down. And again, we don't we don't have to pretend that those things don't exist. We don't have to uh, we don't have to act. Pollyanna is the word that Carol used, which which I love also. Uh, but we can and we should always take a break and really concentrate on the things that we are grateful for. And you know, as Carol said earlier, it can be simple as hey, you know, I. I, I live in a country that allows me a hell of a lot more freedom of expression uh, than many, many other ones. That does not mean that I need to be super jingo and I, I believe the U.S. is perfect because 
Lord knows it's not. But there are tremendous advantages to, you know, to being in a country like this one doesn't have to just be this one. There are other ones that are free, thankfully. Um, but something as simple as that, uh, I try again, I've, I've been working on this for, you know, just for the past few weeks, and I've really had a lot of success with it. And I think I've, um, I think I've come forward just learning to appreciate either the, the taste of something or, you know, if my wife smiles in the morning or, uh, you know, or just something that went well. You know, whether it's a flight or a car ride or whatever, you know, getting through the end of every day uh, and, you know, my my mother and father are still alive. My sister's doing OK. My, you know, whatever. There is always something out there for us to be grateful for. Doesn't mean we're not going to have challenges, but it's really, I think, important. And I think it's it's a good exercise. I've been doing this, too. I, I actually do it on I do it on my phone. I just I have a, a notes app. Uh, and one of the things that I do, it's sort of part of my to do list is write down something positive. Um, for me, the act of writing, the act of actually physically moving my thumbs or a pen to put something down in plants in my head. Not everybody needs to do that. Some people can just appreciate, can have those thoughts to themselves. For me, the, the activity of writing just happens to be something that, that I like to do. Uh, but I would definitely suggest as, as part of your path toward optimism to, to embrace these things. Well, there's an optimism activity. We're just I'm just going to run through what it um, what the process is so that you'll have an idea, but it's called the ABC technique. And it starts out by looking at an um, adversity, something that didn't go well. So maybe uh, you got into a fight with one of your friends, right? So the adversity was there was a fight with your friend. And the belief around that is, wow, I'm a really awful friend and I'll always be like that. Um, and, and so if we tell ourselves that's what the case is, then that's not going to be very optimistic. But if we can say to ourselves, the consequences of that belief is you don't try to make peace with your friend because you can't change who you are. So having that belief that we're a bad friend and then feeling like we can't make that change is not going to help us. So if we have a, have, um, a situation where we get into an argument with our friend and we can switch that belief up and say, I'm really sad that I got into the argument with my friend, and whether I feel like it was my fault or their fault, I really want to um, to repair this relationship. And so I believe that I do have the skills to do that because my friends and I have been friends for a long time. And the consequence of me resolving this is that my friend and I can continue to have each other in our lives, and that's a benefit. So starting with looking at a problem and then looking at your beliefs around it and the consequences of those beliefs and can you have a different set of beliefs around it and if you have a different set of beliefs what are the positive consequences that can come from that instead mm -hmm. our second optimism activity that you can consider that might help build your optimism is identify the situations triggering negative thoughts or moods so if every day when i think about going off to going out to run um i think Oh, I don't want to do that. It's too hot. I might, uh, there might be other dogs that pester my dog. Um, it takes up too much time when I can be sitting and reading the newspaper. So whatever this, so if that's my situation, I end up not wanting to go out and walk, even though I really enjoy walking and it's good for me and for the dog. And then I think about how am I feeling right now? Well, I'm kind of feeling lazy because I've got a lot on my plate and I, it feels like that's just one more thing. So instead of being something enjoyable, it now has become a chore and identify the negative thoughts I have in response to the situation. So I've listed those. I'm, I'm feeling like it's not going to be fun. It's too hot. Um, there could potentially be my dog could see somebody that, that or see another dog and that could start a whole situation. And then look at evidence to either support or refute the negative thoughts. I can then look and think, you know what, if it's too hot, then I can go walking a half hour earlier because I know the benefits of doing that walk and it's good for me. And if my dog gets more opportunities to, to socialize with other dogs, she might not be so reactive and that's going to be long-term much better than if I don't go for a walk and then I try just to hope that things get better. So I focus on the objective facts and replace the automatic negative thoughts with more positive, realistic ones. So for me, the objective facts are there's no guarantee that we're going to run into another dog and there's going to be a situation. There's no reason to believe that it's going to be 
75 degrees when I go out. And if it is, then I go earlier. There's no um, reason to believe that that it's going to be a bad experience instead of believing that it could be a positive one. So when I switch that situation up and I think I'm going to go for a walk and I think, well, sometimes it's too hot and the dog doesn't do really well, but I feel confident that I've got the skills in place to manage that. So maybe I make sure that I carry some extra water with me, ice water, so I'll be nice and cool. And I'll make sure that we don't go on the street that has lots of dogs. And then how does that make me feel? I feel much better about it. I'm excited because it's a nice time for me to spend with the dog. I love being outdoors. There's some people that I like to see along the way. And then instead of identifying the negative thoughts, I'm going to look at the positive thoughts. The positive thoughts I have in response to the situation are it's nice to have that free time where I can daydream because it gives me the permission to spend a half hour just daydreaming and enjoying nature. And then I can look at the evidence to say, and I've done this lots of times, and each time when I allow myself the opportunity to daydream and the dog and I go on a walk without many, without, um, I'm not on the busy street, this, all of those things together are going to help me have a more optimistic attitude. So we're talking about strengthening purpose here, uh, and this is kind of a, a four-step process, so I'll just, I'll just begin and then. Um, Carol can fill this out because again, she's the she's the mental health person, uh, and I'm not. But I but I absolutely uh, identify with this. So I think we begin by identifying values. So understanding what's important to you, and and we've had some great responses to this. These values and motivations. Give some thought to them and write them down. Again, even if they seem obvious, my children, the people that I lead was one of the responses. The people that I manage. Uh, you know, the people who are sort of in a foxhole with me, that's all fantastic. But even though those are obvious things, it's still a good exercise to actually scribble them down or at least really outline them in your head. And then from there, we ask you to pause. Once you clarify what these core values are, then we have to sort of think about how do we integrate them into our day to day life? And sometimes that just takes a 15 second. I mean, at some of you have probably seen um, the calm application is one of the medication, uh, one of the med excuse me, medication, one of the meditation apps that's out there. And you've probably seen from time to time, uh, the, they've got ads actually of commercials where it'll say, do nothing for 15 seconds. And you just sort of see the sound of the rain. I think it's a really, really marvelous ad and it's a great idea. So taking a mindful breath, centering yourself, going, bringing yourself back to the moment that you're in, um, I think is really, really solid. And then reflecting and reframing and acting with purpose. Um, Carol, what are your what are your thoughts on that? I wanna I wanna let you uh, weigh in on this one. Absolutely. So reflecting. So thinking back after we've had that time to pause. So when we start about when we start in the beginning, it's looking at our values and then sitting with it. And again, we we talked about it's okay to sit when things with it when you're not feeling good. It's okay to sit with it when um, things don't seem to be going right and you're looking for a way around that challenge. It's okay to sit with it when you're trying to identify your values and looking at how you can um, strengthen your purpose. Because all of that is just breathing, giving us a moment to be mindful and in the minute, in the moment. And that's going to help us be more true to ourselves and get a more um, appropriate response. And then we reflect and reflame and we think, we think, okay, I'm going to reflect like I was talking about in that last activity. I'm going to reflect. Um, if I do go on this walk, um, am I, how is it going to feel for me afterwards? I'm going to be glad that I got some steps in. I'm going to be glad that I was outside because that's always very rejuvenating for me. And so I'm going to now reframe what I was thinking. And my reframe is going to be, I'm excited about going on this walk, even though there might be challenges. So it's no longer, oh, I hate this walk. I don't want to go there. Um, it's just going to be miserable. I've had time to pause and think about it and then reflect on the positives and the negatives and then reframe that situation of I don't want to do this to this might be kind of fun. And then I'm going to act with my purpose. And I'm going to say, you know, my purpose for this particular activity is to make sure that I can to get my dog well prepared for being in any situation and staying calm, and I can get some time so I can daydream and enjoy that in my um, in part of my daily routine, and I can get some outdoor time where I'm positively stimulated by my surroundings. I'll get some exercise, which I know is good for my body and my mind and my spirit. So I'm going to act with my purpose. Now I know my purpose. I know that I can I can reframe. The situation and feel better about it, and then I'm going to go for it. 
So we have another purpose, purpose, blah, blah, purpose activity. Sorry about that. So write down all the things you absolutely love to do in life. And then think about how do those make you who you are. So are there activities that kind of define you? For me, who am I? I am a mother, first and foremost. I have one son who I adore. Um, so first and foremost, I'm a mother. I'm a sister. I'm an aunt. I'm a cousin. Um, but then outside of that, I'm the other things that I bring to the table. So I'm a student. I'm a trainer, I'm a clinician, um, I'm a ballerina. I do ballet 10 hours a week, so I consider myself a ballerina. Will I ever go do anything outside of our very small stage? Absolutely not. But my purpose, who I am, is a ballerina. And then I'm going to list the things that you do with relative ease. So where do I belong? What are the things that come easy to me? The things that come easy to me is typically talking to other people, helping to support people. Um, doing things with people as a partner, as a companion. When do I feel fulfilled? When I'm, for me personally, when I'm feeling um, like I'm uh, accomplishing my purpose. So when I am helping people out, when I am spending time with those people I love, when I'm talking about things that are important to me and sharing ideas and concepts with others, and what do I love to do? Well, I mentioned that, you know, I love to go to school. I'm in, in school right now, and the conversations that I have with the other students and I, we all get together and we talk about things that we think are important, and it's really fulfilling, and I love that. I love the idea of inviting new ideas into the conversation, hearing different points of view to strengthen my own viewpoint or to learn something new, and I could do that all day long. What comes, uh, what things come easy to me? The things that come easy to me might be things that um, that being there to be supportive of other people. You know, when, when I think about what comes easy to me, cooking for people and then giving them food as a way to support them and show them I care. So there's the things that you can do with ease. All of these things together can help you realize what your purpose is. If it's something that's an arduous task that you hate, it probably shouldn't be part of what you would consider your purpose. And then another purpose activity that we have here is make a list of every single thing that you're passionate about. Now, if you've got a list of 50 things, that's probably good enough. It's a good enough place to start. But what are the things that ignite you, that just make you feel that, that power, that passion, that spark? What are the things? And it can be people. It can be activities. It can be thoughts. It can be philosophies. It can be anything that makes you feel passionate, that if somebody said, tell us about this, you would always go out and speak about it. So for me, talking about resilience and wellness, I can go anywhere and talk about that because I love it and I'm passionate about it and I want to share it with other people. So what are the things that you're passionate about? And then take note of patterns you see in your list. Are there things that can be lumped together? So if I'm passionate about training, I'm passionate about resilience, I'm passionate about connecting with others, well, by being here today, I'm getting to meet several of those things that I consider my purpose. Find ways to devote some time to the purpose you uncover, and that's what I'm doing right now today. You need to, in your own life, decide, um, is this something that I can fulfill through a job or through, is this something I can fulfill through volunteer work? There was someone in one of the chats that said they were doing one type of job and they shifted over to a totally different type of job and weren't really sure how they got there. Probably they were doing some sort of um, unconscious shift of what is my purpose? What's going to bring me joy? How do I feel connected? Where do I feel like I'm, what am I passionate about? And when you know those things, your life kind of leads you in the direction to get those things fulfilled. It's like when we were talking about, are you with people that are positive or not? We don't have to say, I don't want to hang around with you or you or you because you're not passionate and you're not um, optimistic. But those kind of people just don't tend to pop up on our um, people that we want to spend time with. So we're not making a conscious effort to cut those people out. What we are doing is just gravitating towards the things the people that we are interested in. So by the same token, if there's people in your life that you gravitate towards or there's activities that you gravitate towards, that can help you understand what your purpose is. And then keep an open mind to new interests and ways to engage your purpose. Don't think that there's only one path. Recognize that um, the more you talk about what you're passionate about, it can open doors to 
more ideas and concepts of how you can fulfill that. Okay, so we're gonna, I think we're gonna go on. Oh, resources, I believe is where we are, all right? Yeah. Yes, we are. Okay. Ah, I'm sorry. Okay, I, I <laughs> for a second, I was like, I don't know why. I, did, the, I think my computer just froze for a minute. All right, so online resources and applications. The one that I've been using is the first one, Toby uh, or Tubi. I, I'm not even sure how it's pronounced, but T-O-B-E-E. -E. Basically, uh, it's it's a, a really wonderful application. You can you download it; it's completely free. Pops up on your phone, and it just provides affirmations. That's what most of these apps do that you see there. Uh, Eki Guy is a little bit more complicated. I'll talk about that in a second, but. Uh, if you if you are just looking for an affirmation app, something that will you know something that will just pop something up, put it in front of your consciousness at regular intervals, it's a really good idea, and it's incredibly simple to set up. If you download uh, Toby, basically, you simply set the app up by putting in a, a very very minimal information about yourself, pretty much just an age range and kind of where you are currently, how you feel about life uh, as it currently is, because that sort of steers the app in terms of of what is it that you need. And then what's really nice about it, and I'm just grabbing it right now just to take a look at it, is you can choose the category of affirmation that you want, and you can choose the interval. So every 30 minutes, every hour, every three hours, once daily, it will give you uh, affirmations, and you can also you can also customize at some point. Um, I haven't done that. I've just again, I've been focusing on gratitude because I think that's where um, I've had the biggest challenge. Uh, you know, just sort of over, over the over the course of my career, having to sort of keep that in mind and to keep me optimistic. So I ask for the app to just provide me with um, with those kinds of affirmations at pretty much three hour intervals, and it really does make a difference. It really does help. Uh, Happify and Happy Jar are two other apps that do similar things. They provide affirmations for you at intervals that you choose, and you can customize those. And then Ekigai is sort of a a map toward. Uh, your, uh, again, these are Japanese concepts, but a, a Ekigai is the map. It's the sort of pathway toward your reason for being, which is the Ikigai, I guess. It's um, the, the slightly different spelling and probably different pronunciation. I do absolutely do not speak Japanese. Brilliant culture, beautiful language, but it's just not me. <laughs> but um, but I've, I, you know, in preparing for this training, I was checking out these concepts and I was like, wow, that's really cool. Uh, it's something that's been around for a long, long time. And basically what it does is it just, you know, Ekigai is, it helps you by asking questions of yourself. And it, it's sort of a self-guiding aspect. Uh, it's been applied to corporations and teams, to sales teams, to all sorts of, uh, to the military, to, you know, just all sorts of groups of people. And it, it's yet another sort of tool that you can use, another task you can do, asking yourself the important questions about, uh, really about what brings you purpose, what brings you peace, and what keeps you going. And then the self-help books and the podcasts that you see, um, there are several of these out there. Uh, Happier with Gretchen Rubin is one. Um, Gretchen is the usual spelling, G-R-E-T-C. H E N Rubin, R U B I N, The Good Life Project, and a couple of books um, Learned Optimism, How to Change Your Mind and Your Life by Marty uh, Seligman. It's S E L I G M A N. And The Hope Circuit, Psychologist's Journey from Helplessness to Optimism, also by uh, Marty, uh, Marty Seligman. So basically, it's just ways in, you know, looking for resources that will help you to, to sort of see things differently and provide you not just with, you know, good thoughts and feelings, but with, with actual strategies, you know, not just, hey, you should feel better about yourself, but here's a way in which to do that. And hopefully that's what we've been building with you um, over the time that we've had. All right. So our, I believe this is our last question we're going to ask you now is, how will you boost your optimism and fortify your purpose? Um, we hopefully we provided some good solid strategies. Again, you don't have to post answers, but um, we will we will certainly look for them. How will you boost your optimism and fortify your purpose as you go forward? And then our last quote: "No one is you, and that is your superpower." So our own individuality is what makes us who we are. And we need to honor that and own it and be who we are. We can't be somebody else. It's not a possibility. So own who you are and see how you can make yourself the best that you can be.
So wrapping up, um, there's our contact information, Basilia's, mine, and Roger's. If you want to reach out to us, please feel free. We'd love to hear from you. Um, and if you have any questions after the fact that you want to talk with us about, please feel free absolutely to contact us. Yep, please let us know. I am having some issues with my uh, connecting with my camera, but I did want to mention a lot of the uh, registration questions were related to burnout and sort of uh, kind of gauging that. And I would just recommend that if you have any questions about secondary trauma or any of those topics in particular, you revisit our trauma series that we recently did with NTAC. And those uh, videos are up on their website. They're available through YouTube as well. Uh, and they have a lot of great information and they go really into depth of the different aspects, uh, the different domains of secondary trauma and vicarious trauma and how to mitigate it. And as well as providing some really useful tools. And again, you could always check out and uh, OJJDP's website for past webinars. We also have an additional upcoming webinar July 6th on sleep and well being through NTEC. And you can again visit OJJDP's website to register for those. And if anyone has any questions, feel free to type them in the chat. But for the sake of time, we do want to respect everyone's time. And I do want to, if there are any more questions, I do want to pass it along to Alicia. All right, thank you so much, Basilia. I am putting, oh, my colleague just put the OJJDP multimedia page link in the chat. And I also just threw in the YouTube link. It links directly to the playlist for the secondary trauma series that you mentioned. Um, so those are available in the chat for you, as well as the materials link that my colleague also put there in the chat. So as we wrap up today, just a couple reminders. Um, you will receive a certificate of attendance for today's event. Those come automatically to your email that you registered with from WebEx. Um, they are automated, so if you do not see it, please be sure to check your spam folder. Here is our contact information. You can use the link there to sign up for OJJDP's NTAC TTA listserv and hear more about events like this. Um, here is the OJJDP link as well as signing up for their Juve Just listserv and also their events link. Uh, once again, a reminder that these webinars are all available on OJJDP's multimedia and YouTube page. Again, those links are also in the chat. We have two more events coming up. Um, the next Innocent Justice Foundation uh, webinar is on July 6th, and that one is on sleep and well being. And then we also have a preventing youth hate crimes and bullying initiative um, event, and that is assisting victims of hate crimes, and that one's on June 23rd. You can stay connected with OJJDP at the following social media accounts. Thank you so much for joining us today. I hope you have a great rest of your day. And let us know in the chat if you have any questions. We'll keep the chat open for about 30 more seconds. Thank you all Thank so you much. Thank you, everyone.